This is our 10th spring cleaning season here on YouTube. We've got tons and tons of spring cleaning videos, but today I have curated 20 of them for you. Things that you're probably not doing during the rest of the year. And I'm walking you through the PTTs, the products, tools, and techniques, what you need to do to get that job done right and quickly so that you can actually go outside and enjoy spring. So like I said, I've got 20 of these videos for you. Let's get right into it. Give this video a thumbs up for you for spring cleaning. And if you're interested in making your own cleaning recipes, you can go to our website, cleanmyspace.com shop. Also got a link for you down below. And you can find our ebook with 50 DIY cleaning recipes. It has been getting rave reviews, so go check it out. The front hall closet is one of my MIAs or most important areas whenever I think about my home and the front hall closet specifically gets so messy. And at the time of spring, we've got all of our winter gear in there. It's exploding with boots and shoes and jackets and gloves and scarves and dirt and sand that has been traipsed in all winter, which is why that area needs a really good spring refresh. This video was taken in 2014 from our older home. You're gonna see all the mess, including sliding mirror doors and those tracks that can feel so difficult to clean. So here we go. This week, I'm tending to one of the most neglected areas in my home, the front closet, or the coat closet, or the entry closet. It has a lot of names, but the one I'm referring to is the closet which resides closest to your front door, this one. In my home, this is where we keep our winter coats, our shoes, our boots, our gloves, our hats and scarves, umbrellas, keys, shopping bags, and a whole bunch of other stuff that we like to keep conveniently by the front door in one small little space. The problem is that over time, these things start to build up, and especially after this winter, they create a closet catastrophe. Now, this closet isn't included in my regular cleaning routine, so seeing as how it's spring and we're talking spring cleaning, I figured it's a great time to address this mess. And who knows, maybe it's something that you're planning on cleaning too. This video is an excerpt from the Ultimate Spring Cleaning Guide, which you can find over at cleanmyspace.com. You can also join the free Clean My Space community while you're there. All right. Let's get started. And to do that, we're gonna remove everything from the closet. The first step is an easy one. Remove everything, and I actually mean everything, from your closet. Take out all of the shoes and boots and place them off to the side. We'll get to those soon enough. Take all of your coats and find a temporary place for them. Do the same for your hats and mittens and gloves and scarves, umbrellas, and anything else in your closet. We need it bare naked to continue to step two, which is vacuuming and wiping. We'll start this step by vacuuming out the whole closet, top to bottom, including any shelves and even the corners where spider webs can linger. Next, for those of you with a sliding door like mine, you're going to clean the track using all-purpose cleaner and a microfiber cloth perhaps using a vacuum with brush attachment or cleaning toothbrush if necessary to get right in there. And wipe any dirt or marks left on the walls. Then hand wipe the floor. I know it's awkward, but it's hard to get a mop in there. Finish this step up by giving the doors a good wipe down. As you can see, mine are mirror doors, so I'm just using a simple mixture of vinegar and water and a microfiber cloth. Now, if your closet has regular painted wood doors, you can just use an all-purpose cleaner to wipe them down. The spring change out. Now that the winter is finally gone, I don't need any more of these in my coat closet. So what I've done is picked up one of these. It's a vacuum bag and it's essentially an extra large zippered bag where you can suck all of the air out of the top once you're done stuffing it full of all of the things you don't need to use anymore. So I'm gonna put all of these in here, suck out the air and stuff it under my bed. Now, of course, if you have an extra closet in your house, you can store your winter jackets there instead. And here's a handy hack for those who do. Stuff silica gel packs into the pockets of your coat to protect from moisture while being stored. 
This is also a really good opportunity for you to donate any winter clothing that you didn't wear or wear very little during this past winter season. If you have a coat or gloves or hat or scarf that you didn't wear, odds are you're not going to wear them next winter. So don't take up space in your home storing these things that you don't use, especially when someone else could use them a lot more. Do the same thing for your shoes and your boots. Donate whatever you haven't worn or just don't need anymore. One thing we already use in our closet that helps manage the mess are these two bins, which contain all of our winter accessories. We don't have a spare closet, so we keep them right here on the top shelf, and they keep our hats and gloves and scarves out of the way, especially for those warmer months. This is a new purchase this year. We bought this shoe shelf to help tackle the small amount of floor space and the large amount of shoes we have in our closet. Here's a cool trick to be able to tell if it's time to donate or at least get rid of any shoes. Start with all of your shoes pointing toe out. And as you wear the shoes and put them back on the shelf, turn them around to point heel out. After a few months, you'll start to identify the shoes that you don't wear anymore. For the other side of the closet, we picked up one of these hanging shoe holders, which will be used to hold my shoes. Lastly, we're going to be installing some hooks in the closet so we can store our reusable bags and they'll be convenient to grab on our way out the door to the grocery store. Naturally, you'll also be able to use these hooks to hang purses or keys or whatever else you need. A few simple hooks in your closet can really help curb the clutter and can conceal items from curious sets of eyes. Washing machines are one of those places in the house that sometimes we think clean themselves because they are cleaning machines, also like your dishwasher. But your washing machine indeed does need some TLC on a fairly regular basis and spring is a great time to clean your washing machine. Here's how to do it. People often ask the frequency of doing this particular type of cleaning and I think it entirely depends on how frequently you're using your machine. And that would be dictated by how many people are in your family and approximately how many loads of laundry you do a week. If you're a single person or two of you living in a home, you're probably doing less laundry than a family of three, four, or seven. So just keep that in mind. If you do a lot of laundry, say a load a day, you might wanna consider doing this once a month. But if you're doing one or two loads a week, you can probably get away with doing this once a quarter. So since the last time we put out the video, we've kind of rethought the whole cleaning the interior drum process and we've slimmed it down. We used to do two loads, now we're just gonna do one. So the way that I want you to start is like this. Take everything out of the washing machine. You want an empty drum and you're gonna create a paste with two parts baking soda and one part water. Now the reason I like this paste is because baking soda is our friend, it's a little bit gritty, so it's gonna help remove any of that buildup that could be stuck on the drum. Baking soda is also great at deodorizing and we know that the inside of a washing machine drum can be a little bit on the side. All right, so we're gonna take that solution, dip a sponge, into it and start to just gently apply it and scrub the inside of the drum. This shouldn't take very long. I know it sounds laborious, but it actually can go quite quickly. So you're just gonna work your way around the drum and I would just spin it and scrub, spin it and scrub. Once that's done, you're gonna take a microfiber cloth, get it nice and wet and start to wipe out the baking soda. So again, just give it a good spin like you're on the price is right, give it a wipe, spin again, wipe and make sure that all that baking soda, or as much as possible, is out. The second step is to take a cup of white vinegar and to it, you're going to add 10 drops of tea tree essential oil. This is a great and powerful combination. The vinegar is going to help break down soap scum and odors, and the tea tree essential oil is great at tackling mold and mildew and odor causing bacteria. So throw those two things, don't throw them, gently pour them into the detergent tray and set your cycle for the hottest possible cycle or the tub clean cycle. Either is going to work and they should essentially do the same thing. By the time that is done, your machine is going to be not only visually sparkling, but should smell a lot better. And the thing I love the most is when something has been cleaned and it smells like nothing. 
Now there are products that you can buy that would sort of shortcut you from having to do the DIY version I just described. Either will work well and let me clear up some fake news for you because you might have been scrolling through Instagram or Facebook and seen my face associated with some cleaning tablet for a washing machine or a dishwasher that you've otherwise never heard of. Well, the funny thing is neither have I, and they actually stole that footage from a campaign that we did many years ago with Afresh. Afresh is one of the products that you can use to clean your machine. It's a tablet. There are other mach uh, machine cleaning products out there that come in gel form. We've had great relationships with two brands that we've worked with in the past for machine cleaners. And I can assure you, none of those ads are active right now. So if you see me holding up a tablet, just know that that is stolen footage. You know what it feels like. It's warm, it's rubbery, it's a little bit slimy. It's your washing machine gasket and it gets disgusting. It's important to stay on top of keeping this clean because I've got to tell you, that's like the epicenter of odors in your washing machine. So there are a couple of things you can do. We'll talk about like the actual cleaning and then we'll talk about the maintenance. If you want to clean it and if it's not in dire condition, what you can do is make a solution with equal parts dish soap and vinegar. To that solution is add 10 drops of tea tree oil for reason previously mentioned. Mix that all up, get a soft sponge and apply it to the outside and the inside of the gasket. You've really got to get your hand and your sponge in there. You want to kind of agitate it and scrub it around. And this is going to help break down any of that odor causing bacteria and that buildup that just kind of gets trapped in the gasket over time. Now, when that's done, take a microfiber cloth soaked in water and give it a really good rinse just to get rid of any of that suds and any of the remaining vinegar. Now, if your gasket really has seen better days and you think that it's beyond repair, it's worth replacing. Now, you can find videos online about how to do it yourself. I always feel like when it comes to something like an appliance or something that's expensive, rather than trying to jimmy rig it, I would much prefer bringing in a professional and letting them do it. We actually looked into it and there's quite a bit of work that you have to do to replace the gasket. You have to remove several parts of the machine. And the thing I always worry about is potentially voiding the warranty. So here's what I'll tell you. Your machine costs several hundred dollars. It's probably going to cost a couple hundred dollars to replace the gasket. You might as well just bring in a pro and let them do it the right way. Maintaining the exterior of the washing machine is a breeze. You can just use all purpose cleaner and a microfiber cloth, give it a good wipe down. The thing I have found over the years, cleaning hundreds of places and hundreds of laundry rooms, you get a lot of soap residue. And it's just because, you know, you're pouring soap, some spills, eh, big deal. You kind of move on with your day, but over time it builds up. So the best thing you can do is just take a damp cloth, give it a wipe, a couple scrubs, and it should be gone. If you notice any detergent caught in buttons or wheels, you can just use a cleaning toothbrush that's slightly dampened, give it a little bit of a scrub and wipe it down. An area that we often forget to clean but that really needs attention is the detergent tray. And here's the reason. Soap feeds bacteria. A nice dark, damp environment, which is where your detergent tray is, quite literally, is the perfect breeding ground for that odor causing bacteria and other moldy buildup that you can experience in your machine. That's why it's so important to remove it and give it a good cleaning. Now the exact same solution we use for the gasket is going to be perfect for cleaning your detergent tray. As well, if you pick up a store-bought liquid or gel machine cleaner, that would work just fine for cleaning that tray as well. A few rapid fire tips to keep in mind to keep your machine clean and smelling fresh for as long as possible. Your doors should always be open when they're not in use. That goes for your detergent tray door as well as your actual washing machine door itself. When those two are open, air is allowed to circulate, which means the odor causing bacteria doesn't have access to that warmth and moisture that it thrives on. So keep that in mind. This is one of those great pieces of advice that I try to keep in mind each and every time. I'm not perfect at it, but I do it as often as I can remember. And that is to wipe the inside of the door and the gasket after each load of laundry. Now, the easy way to do that is just to keep a microfiber cloth on top of your washing machine for that specific purpose. It 
doesn't take that long. Honestly, when I'm in a rush, I forget to do it. But when I see the cloth there, it signals me and it reminds me. And what this does, it removes any of that soap scum, both from the door and inside the gasket so that moisture isn't there. Therefore, that bacteria buildup, which causes odor and that mold can't actually grow. It's kind of the same as using a squeegee in your shower after each shower. Another great way to keep your machine from smelling unsavory is to move your laundry over as quickly as you can. So when you hear the bell, dinger, whatever you wanna call it, move it on over to the dryer. That just prevents odor causing bacteria from lingering and building up. Also, make sure that you're using the right amount of laundry detergent for the load. If you use too little, too much dirt will be left behind in the machine after the wash and your clothing actually won't come out looking great. And if you use too much, you're gonna have soap scum lingering behind. So use those little notches on the cup to think, is my machine a third full, halfway full, or three quarters full? And that should really tell you how much detergent you should be using. And finally, we have a video on this, and the only reason we have a video on, on it is because my mom kept telling me that I had to do this, otherwise I would have had no idea. And that is to clean your washing machine filter. I'm gonna link that video for you down below. Whether you have horizontal or vertical blinds, you know they need to be cleaned from time to time, and this method does not require them to be removed. There seems to be two main schools of thought when it comes to cleaning slatted blinds, vertical or horizontal. The first involves a simple use of a cloth, some dish liquid, water, a bucket, and your hands. Now the second involves taking the blinds down, putting them in your bathtub, scrubbing them, drying them, and then putting the blinds back up. To me, one measure seems reasonable and the other, let's say extreme. I've never had anything so nasty on my blinds that it required me to remove them from the windowsill and actually clean them. So with that in mind, let me show you the first method, how to clean your blinds using a few simple tools. I should mention that this method works wonderfully on aluminum, plastic, or wood blinds. However, I wouldn't recommend it for fabric blinds, which actually do need to be taken down, perhaps even unstrung and bathed in warm, not hot, soapy water, rinsed well, and left flat to dry. First thing we'll do is get as much dust off the blind as we can using a duster, or better yet, a vacuum. For horizontal blinds, work top to bottom, and for vertical blinds, work left to right. If you're using a vacuum, select a brush attachment, and if you're going to dust by hand, you can choose one of several dusting tools, including a proper blind duster like this one, a simple microfiber cloth, or even an old sports sock turned inside out and worn on your hand as a sock puppet. Then you can do a puppet show after. I find feather dusters throw too much dust around, so I avoid them altogether, even though they do make you look like a sexy French maid. Now for the actual washing part. Add three drops of dish liquid into a bowl or a bucket and fill with warm water. Take a microfiber cloth and dunk it into the mixture. Ring well to the point of the cloth being damp dry. Now twist the blind slats so that they lie completely flat. Take your cloth and starting from the top for vertical or left for horizontal, pinch the cloth around each blind slat and wipe away dirt and dust by pulling the cloth to the other end of the slat. Rinse your cloth as you go and you'll be surprised and a little disgusted about how dirty your cloth is going to get. If you have heavy staining on the blinds like grease, dead bug residue, dog slobber or nicotine, you can add a bit of baking soda to the wash, like say a tablespoon and that should help break down the scummy buildup. If you have vertical blinds, the steps are the same, except you'll have to start at the top of the slat and work your way down to the bottom. You might need a step ladder to do this too. Once your blinds are clean, you can maintain them by dusting on a regular basis using a simple duster or your vacuum. Just turn the blinds upright and work from the top and make your way to the bottom. That's all there is to it, and the best part is you don't have to fiddle with your blinds by taking them down, waiting for them to dry, and then putting them back up. And a quick note on cleaning fabric blinds, I don't have any to demonstrate on, but what I do recommend is to vacuum them regularly to avoid buildup and discoloration. There are tons of videos and photographs of beautifully organized kitchen cabinets. That's not what this next video is about, no. 
It is about how to actually spring clean your cabinets, your cupboards, and your pantry in your kitchen. This was filmed in our old, old kitchen, but I show you the technique. So you can worry about organizing it after. This is how to get rid of everything, how to thoroughly clean it, and how to sort through what you have in there so you know exactly what you need to put back. The first thing we're going to do is put some music on because everything is better with music. Next, we're going to clear everything from the kitchen counter. We need a place to put the contents of each cupboard, so a clear counter or kitchen table is a requirement for this job. For the cleaning part of today's job, we're going to have two or three microfiber cloths handy and, of course, some all-purpose spray. It's also a good idea to have a step stool on hand to reach those top shelves. The first cupboard I'm going to tackle is the cupboard where we keep all of our plates, our bowls, and a few other miscellaneous items. So let's clear out all of the cupboard contents. And we're going to use a handheld vacuum to suck up all of the bric-a-brac that has been left behind. A vacuum like this is a huge help for the job. Check the description box for more details. Next, we'll spray the shelves and doors with our all-purpose spray and give everything a good wipe down. I'm even cleaning the hinges here. If you use shelf liners like I do, to clean them, just wipe them and then replace them. And then we'll replace all of the dishes back into the cupboard, remembering to put the more popular items on the lower shelf and the lesser used items up top. Finally, we'll give the outside of the cupboards a quick wipe. Cupboard number two consists mostly of canned food. And we'll start out the same way we did with cupboard number one, clearing out the cupboard completely. Now, because this is a food cupboard, I noticed quite a few spills and messes over the shelves. So we're gonna use some simple baking soda to combat those. First, spray your cupboards down with the all-purpose cleaner, and then sprinkle some baking soda on and scrub your mess away using a scouring pad. Once that's done, wipe it clean with your microfiber cloths and you'll see no stains left behind. We'll also wipe down both sides of the door. And now for a very important job, we're going to go through all food items and ensure that nothing has expired. We're also gonna look for items that are still good, but have sat in the cupboard serving no real purpose. Remember, you only need about a week's worth of food in your cupboard. Storing food until it expires is wasteful. So anything that hasn't expired and just sits in your cupboard, just gets donated. Once that's done, everything else gets put back into the cupboard. You can group similar items so that they're easier to find, and there's a bunch of cool storage solutions like this little stacker I found. You can find links to some of these in the description below. Cupboard number three is my secret microfiber cloth stash, and also where we keep our tea towels and other cloths and rags. This one will be pretty straightforward. Everything comes out, we'll vacuum, spray and wipe, and then we'll neatly refold all of the cloths and place them back into the cupboard. Easy peasy. This cupboard is where we keep teas and coffee and cocoa and a few other odds and ends. This cupboard is right above our coffee maker and the kettle, so it's handy to keep all of our hot beverage related items here. Once again, we'll vacuum, spray and wipe, and then everything gets put back in a neat and orderly fashion. I'm also checking expiry dates as I do this. Cupboard number five contains all of our drinking vessels, mugs and glasses and whatnot. I think you know by now what we're going to be doing in this cupboard, taking everything out, vacuuming, spraying, wiping, and then replacing the glasses, cups and mugs back in there. But we are going to rid ourselves of any items we just don't use anymore. I had about a half dozen mugs, which I just don't use, so we'll be donating those. Cupboard number six also contains food, mostly Chad's food, based on the size of this Nutella jar. Same thing as cupboard number two. Clear it out, vacuum and wipe it down, donate expired items, toss anything you don't eat anymore, and then place everything back in a neat orderly fashion. I can't remember the last time I opened cupboard number seven. 
I can only reach it with a step stool and it really only contains some plastic cutlery, napkins, some Hanukkah candles. It also contains a really old soft taco kit. More on that at the end of this video. Cupboard number eight is probably the mother of all jobs for cupboards. This is where we keep cleaning supplies and garbage bags and garbage and cat food and a whole bunch of other stuff. This cupboard is also disgustingly dirty. Yeah, even in my house. So I'll break out the scouring pad again. I'm using some Barkeeper's Friend and I'll give the bottom of this cupboard a really good scrubbing. Then I'll vacuum and wipe and put everything back in there. Aside from the items that I don't need anymore. Again, the more popular items will reside nearest to the front of the cupboard, with the back of the cupboard being reserved for the less popular items. Cupboard number nine, and we're almost done. This small cupboard is where we keep our pots and pans and a few other cooking items, and by the way, this cupboard makes me crazy. I'm sure you know by now we'll remove all of the stuff, vacuum, spray, wipe clean, and then put everything back. And one of these days, I'm going to figure out a way to organize this darn thing. Cupboard number 10 is the final cupboard and only contains paper towels, so this one's a pretty quick one. And now we'll tackle our kitchen drawers. It's pretty much the same procedure with the cupboards. We're going to empty everything from the drawer and then vacuum it out. Spray and wipe and then place everything back in the drawer. As you can see, I'm also using this as an opportunity to get rid of some excess cutlery, which is clogging up my already micro drawer. If it's a piece of cutlery we haven't used in six months, it's being donated to free up some much needed space. The second drawer would classify, I guess, as our junk drawer. It's full of miscellaneous kitchen tools, so here's a handy tip to figure out what needs to stay and what needs to go. Place a bin on your countertop and place all of your junk drawer items in that bin. Over the next three months, you'll take any item that you need out of the bin, use it, and then place that item back in your drawer. At the end of three months, anything that's left in the bin is stuff you probably don't need anymore. We'll round out this set of drawers by tackling the third and fourth drawer, which contain my saran wrap tin foil and also our containers. Now I had to take a seat, that was a lot of work, I'm not going to lie. It took me about three hours to go through our entire kitchen and our house is just under 2,000 square feet so you can use that as sort of a baseline for when you're going through and doing this. I know it's a lot of work but if you keep your eye on the prize, you will have a clean and organized kitchen that feels so much more manageable and easy to work in throughout the year. Honestly, the amount of space that I've freed up and the amount of stuff that I'm getting rid of feels great. And it's also a great reminder, and we talked about this in the bathroom cleaning video, that when you're out and you're purchasing something, whether it's a food item or a utensil or a small appliance, it will really remind you of, do I want to buy this and figure out where to store it? Or is it unnecessary and can I do without it? Quick funny story about Chad and Melissa. When Chad and I first started dating, he lived somewhere in the city of Toronto. And when I went to his house, I found this box of taco, what do you, what do you call it? Taco mix? Taco, a taco kit? A soft taco. A soft taco kit in his cupboard. And then he moved to another place and I opened the cupboards one day and there it was again. Clearly he hadn't eaten it. And then he moved into another place and the stupid soft taco kit was there again. This thing is so ancient, but here it is. And now it's kind of a joke and we just keep it in a cupboard in our house as kind of a reminder to not store crap and we laugh at it every time we see it. There are two types of ovens, the self-cleaning kind and the non-self-cleaning kind. In this video, we're gonna talk about how to clean the non-self-cleaning kind of oven. Cleaning your oven really is a choose your own adventure type cleaning task because you can dial it up or dial it down as much as you want. In other words, depending on how much effort you want to put in, you can really go full force or you can kind of squeak by. So today I'm just going to be showing you how to clean the cavity of the oven itself. I've got a couple of other reference videos I'll link for you down below on this topic. But a few things I want to point out. First and foremost, cleaning the oven really should happen on a fairly regular basis. 
I can't tell you, I can't like prescribe an exact amount of time. You'll know based on how frequently you cook and how frequently things bubble over. But essentially when you start to see spills and you know, crusty buildup at the bottom of the oven, it'll eventually cook and cook and cook until it becomes carbonized or like blackened. And then what'll happen is you'll start to get smoke when you're cooking. It'll affect the flavors of your food. You'll kind of think your kitchen's on fire. So that's why it's really important to kind of stay on top of this and make sure that you're cleaning your oven when you start to see and smell those cues. Now, when you're actually in the oven, aside from removing the racks, you want to be really careful that you're not getting product into fans if you have a convection oven or into any of the burners or coils or heating elements that are inside your oven either. You actually wanna be really careful around that because you don't wanna cause any damage. So when you're cleaning the inside cavity, just work your way around that. Now let's talk about in between those two glass panes in the oven door. They are, they are a pain, okay? And the thing is, you can't really clean them. I mean, you can, you will just void your warranty if you do it because you've got to take the door apart and oven manufacturers don't like when we try to do that stuff ourselves. Now you can kind of jimmy rig something where you put paper towel over a fly swatter and stick it up, fine. If you want to try that, you can. I'm not going to demo that in this video because I don't have time for it, but if you want to try that, you certainly can. Just keep in mind, don't take your oven door apart. You will void the warranty. You'll probably notice here that I have some very simple cleaning products and easy to find household cleaning tools. That's because oven cleaning doesn't have to be complicated and it doesn't have to be harsh. You just have to know what you're doing and have a plan of attack. I'm not a firm believer in using heavy duty oven cleaning chemicals. First of all, I'm not totally comfortable using them. And second of all, I don't want those chemicals in my oven that will then cook food that me and my family will eat. So that's why I like to keep it pretty simple. I'm gonna give you a rundown of the things that I have here uh, so that you can grab them and clean along with me. First and foremost, got some paper towel. I've got a microfiber cloth and vinegar. This is for after the fact. We're not using this during the cleaning. I've then got dish soap and baking soda. That's right, I bought it from the bulk food store um, that we're gonna be using as our main product for cleaning the oven. I've got a scraper. You can use a windshield scraper, old credit card, or one of these. I'll link it for you down below. Then I've got a Scotch-Brite heavy-duty scrub pad. Love these for this task. And I've, oops, and I've also got some steel wool which I probably won't use, but it's always good to have on hand in case you need to level up a bit. Oh, and I also have some newspaper, which I'll be putting on the floor to catch all the dirt. Today, I'm also going to be cleaning the drawer and the area under the drawer. So I will start by removing everything from the drawer. And this is just good general practice because when you're cleaning your oven, you might get some liquid dripping in. Next up, I'm removing the oven racks as well. You can clean those in the bathtub. I've got that video for you linked below. Now, lining the area with newspaper is a good idea. It just saves you from having to do additional cleanup afterward. Looking inside the cavity of the oven, if you will, you'll see there's quite a bit of buildup in there and some of it's loose and some of it is hardened on, which is why I'm using this scraper to do some cursory cleaning. I want to get off as much as I can so that I don't actually have to scrub and clean that mess up. So I'm just using a paper towel to do that, wiping it all out. Now I'm making up a solution, four parts baking soda, one part dish soap, one part water. I'll stir it up and you want to have a nice thick paste so you can fiddle around with the consistency if you want it a little bit thinner, go for it. I'm just applying it by hand here. I'm sure there's a more eloquent way to do it, but I just felt like going crazy, crazy town. So here I am, I'm putting it on the sides, even on the door, but I have a feeling I'm gonna do the door with Barkeeper's Friend. Now I'm removing that drawer and just using a handheld vacuum to get under, because seriously, who is pulling out their oven? And I found a giant spider web, so it was a good thing I did it. Now I'm using a paper towel to wipe out any of the debris, and then I'm giving it a good spray because obviously I can't put this in the sink. I'm using a soap filled sponge just to give it a good scrub down. Then I'm going to use a wet microfiber cloth to rinse the interior of this drawer and I can put it off to the side. A little pro tip here is to put a towel down so that your knees don't get sore. Now in that bowl, I've just got some water. 
I've waited 30 minutes, by the way, to do this. That product has sat for 30 minutes and I'm just starting to scrub. Now you guys will notice I'm using my left hand only. My right shoulder, for those of you who don't know, I dislocated it a while ago, so I actually can't clean with that arm and it is my dominant arm, so my cleaning chops are a little bit suffering right now, but bear with me. So I'm doing a mix of the scraper and the heavy duty scrub pad, making sure to get the sides, the back, and of course the bottom as well. I'm gonna give this window a good cleaning, but again, I'm just gonna use Barkeeper's Friend because it needs that extra oomph. It took me between five and 10 minutes to scrub inside that oven. And again, I was using my non-dominant hand, so I didn't get the best results. But that's essentially the technique that you're going to use. And now I'm just using water and microfiber cloths to quote unquote rinse the inside of the oven because baking soda leaves a residue behind. I'm gonna finish it up with a vinegar rinse here. So I'm just taking another microfiber cloth and giving everything a final wipe down with some vinegar. That just helps to cut any residual grease and polish things up in there. Now I'm splashing water onto the interior oven window and I'm sprinkling Barkeeper's Friend on there. It's a super powerful product, but you can only use it on the glass in here. I'm using that heavy duty scrub pad to get all of that build up off. It really does take a little bit of effort, well, actually a lot of elbow grease, but it does come off and this window ended, coming, ended up coming out beautifully clean. So here I'm using a microfiber cloth dipped in water to quote unquote rinse it off. You may want to do it once or twice. And you can see that glass is clean. I mean, the interior panels are another story, but the glass itself is very clean. And let's say you have a self-cleaning oven. I haven't forgotten about you. That's what this video is for. Hey everyone, it's Melissa Maker here helping you solve your cleaning conundrums. Here's another cleaning question from one of our subscribers. And it's actually Tara, 1979 Tara. In the other video I did, I did 1979 Tara, 1979. It's the same person, but with two great questions. The second of her questions was, Hey Melissa, how do I clean my self-cleaning oven properly and how do I get the glass inside the self-cleaning oven clean? This is a great question. As the owner of a cleaning company, I can assure you one of the biggest issues that our clients have are that they're afraid of cleaning their self-cleaning oven. Whoever invented the self-cleaning oven is secretly brilliant. Cleaning the oven is probably one of the most difficult cleaning tasks we have to face in the kitchen. So the fact that we have an appliance that cleans itself is freaking awesome. The problem is a lot of people are scared of how to do it because it gets really hot and it smells and smoke comes out. So let me tell you the right way to clean it. What I always recommend is to start with the manufacturer's instructions. Samsung's manual is like the size of a phone book. Once you get yourself acquainted with these instructions, you'll be able to do this job and it won't be so scary. If you don't have the manual, go on the Google. Now sometimes people say, why can't I just clean my oven by hand? Well, if you wanted to do that, you should have saved the $1,000 and bought a non-self-cleaning oven. The reason we don't want to clean a self-cleaning oven by hand is because there's a coating called a pyrolytic coating on the inside of your self-cleaning oven that allows it to self-clean. It'll actually remove that coating and that coating is a fortune. So preserve it and do it properly. Now there's nothing wrong with cleaning your self-cleaning oven between self-clean cycles, so long as you're using the proper tools. So something like a soft cloth or the soft side of a sponge with a little bit of soap is no problem. But something scratchy and abrasive like an abrasive cleanser, a steel wool pad or a razor blade would actually ruin that pyrolytic coating. So we don't wanna do that. The first thing we'll do is talk about some general, you gotta do this before you self clean the oven tips. Ventilate your space. What you'll do is turn on your overhead fan. I'm not gonna turn it on because mine sounds like a tornado. You're gonna open your windows and if you have any pets, especially birds, you wanna move them far away from the kitchen. A couple reasons why we wanna do this. First, the pets. Uh, if they inhale the smoke, it can actually be really bad for them and in some cases, birds have died from this. The second reason we want to ventilate is because the smoke can linger in your house, set off your smoke alarm and stick to your wall. The next thing you want to do is remove everything. You got to strip your oven naked. Now that includes the warming drawer, your oven racks. Now some people say, well, why can't you just leave them in the oven? It's a great question. Nothing 
terrible will happen to them, but that shiny metallic coating will actually become dull and that will make it harder to pull the racks in and out. Those can easily be cleaned in a sink with a soft sponge, a little bit of baking soda, and some dishwashing liquid. And if they're really bad, you can soak them in a bathtub. And the final precaution we'll want to take before setting our self-clean cycle is to remove any food that we possibly can from the bottom or the sides of the oven. So you can either do this by hand or you can use a cleaning tool like this scraper. And this is a non-scratching scraper, of course. The reason we want to do that is because the food stuck at the bottom, if it can be removed, it should be removed. It will make for an easier self-clean cycle. So what happens during a self-clean cycle? How does this oven magically clean itself? Well, quite simply, it heats up to 900 to 1000 degrees. So obviously make sure you don't touch it. Essentially what happens is anything inside the oven turns into a gray white kind of ash. Almost like what you would get at the end of a campfire or something. When you're finished, you'll take a damp cloth and you'll just wipe it out top to bottom, make sure you get the sides, and keep rinsing and wringing out the cloth until the inside of the oven is clean. Then you'll put your clean racks back in and your oven is good to go. How long will this whole process take? About three to four hours. So just be prepared. A great feature that all self-clean ovens come with is a self-lock function. The oven will lock and will not open again until the self-clean function finishes. This is for your own protection, so don't think that something really weird is happening to your oven. If you hear a loud click and the door won't open anymore, your oven's doing the right thing. Upon completion of your self-clean cycle, if you notice that the glass panel on the inside of your oven door is still dirty, what you can do is sprinkle a little bit of baking soda and then spray some water on top of it to form a little bit of a paste. Let that baking soda sit. If it's really bad, you can even let it sit overnight. And then in the morning, just take a soft cloth and wipe off the baking soda. That paste should help remove any of the other buildup grease or grime that you'll see on the oven door. Now be careful not to put too much water because if you'll notice in the window where the self-clean oven is, if water gets past that barrier, you'll see those forever drip marks. Tara, thanks so much for the question. I hope it helped you and I know it'll help a lot of other people too. The fridge is one of those areas that can easily become gross quietly over time, which is why a spring clean or a more frequent clean if you have it in you is crucial for a fridge. And it's important that you do it properly so that you time everything right with the food and you make sure that you're not spending half a day doing it. First things first, you gotta empty the fridge. Don't be judgmental here, just pull everything out and get it on your counter. What I did instead of unplugging my fridge is I actually turned off the cooling mechanism so that I wasn't wasting electricity during this process. You just have to make sure that you turn it back on at the end of the cleaning. Now, as with any cleaning task, I'm just working from the top to the bottom. That way I'm being strategic and I'm not forgetting anything. Next up, it's time to remove the baskets, the bins, and the shelves. If you're not too familiar with your fridge, I would say to do this slowly and carefully. That way you don't break anything. Having been in the cleaning business for a long time, I can tell you I have broken one or two fridge shelves and I've learned over the years, do it gingerly. Now I'm going to pre-treat the inside of the fridge with a simple all-purpose cleaner. We'll deal with that after. Next up, I'm sprinkling some baking soda in all of these little trays and bins and on the shelves, as well as spraying it with all-purpose cleaner. This is going to help provide a little bit of extra abrasion, deodorization, and stain removal. I've got a cleaning toothbrush, a microfiber cloth, and some all-purpose cleaner, and I'm going to tackle the inside of this fridge, moving from the top to the bottom, working my way from left to right. Now, I'm respraying any areas that I clean only because I wanna make sure that they're nice and wet when I'm actually giving them a wipe down. That way, if there are any stains, they'll come off easier. 
the cleaning toothbrush is there to get into those little grooves, particularly in the crisper drawer and the shelf area. Uh, you know, you can find like dried up pieces of lettuce or small little chunks of cheese that you really can't get out any other way aside from flicking them out with a little toothbrush. Finally, I'm tackling the gaskets, which are those little rubber seals around the doors. Those can get dirty and filthy over time, so use your cleaning toothbrush, give it a good little scrub, and then wipe it clean with a microfiber cloth. You can also do your door hinges at this time too. Now I'll take this double-sided sponge, I make sure it's damp, and then I'm going to tackle each one of these shelves and bins and drawers. It doesn't take too long. What I find is when they've had a chance to pre-treat, they clean up much easier and that baking soda really helps remove any of the extra gunky stuff that's been built up. Now for these bigger items, I like to clean them and replace them one at a time because frankly, it can be really overwhelming to find counter space, particularly when all of your refrigerated items are on your counter as well. So for these bigger things, I would just clean them, dry them and put them right back. Now it's important that you dry everything really well because you don't want to have excess moisture going back into the fridge after you've cleaned it. Again, if you're unsure how your shelves or your bins get reinstalled, just work slowly and make sure that you don't break or damage anything because these fridge components can be so expensive to replace. These panels of glass are also very challenging to work with, so just move slowly handle them gently, and when you're cleaning and rinsing and replacing them, just take a little bit of extra time. You've got to take my word on this one. What can be particularly difficult to clean in your fridge are these little rings or stubborn spots that have just sat there and built up over time. That is what's gonna require the most amount of cleaning, but that baking soda and all-purpose cleaner combo really helps remove any of that stickiness. The other thing you might notice, particularly in your crisper drawers, are stains from, you know, zucchini or broccoli or kale or whatever have you that sat at the bottom of the bin for a long time and eventually discolored it. This is something that you might be able to remove with a bit of baking soda and hydrogen peroxide. So you can always give that trick a shot as well. Now these bins came out pretty nice and clean, so I'm pretty happy. My fridge, I think, actually looks better than the day I moved in. Now, I'm going to start filling it back up. What I do is have a microfiber cloth and a little bit of all-purpose cleaner handy. And before I replace an item, of course I make sure, yeah, I still want it, I still need it, and it's still edible. And the next thing I'll do is give the bottom of that container a wipe. That's why you see me doing this in fast motion. I'm just holding, wiping, replacing and anything that I'm not keeping, I'm just leaving on the counter. This is also a great chance for you to take inventory of what's in your fridge, what you might be out of, you know, do I need more pesto? Is that coconut milk just about finished? You know, you can really start to keep track of things and make a mental note of what you're looking for. 
Always important to replace your box of baking soda. You should be doing this four times a year or at the change of every season. It just helps your fridge stay a little fresher and your food tastes better. Your floor is actually pretty crusty at the end of a fridge cleaning, so you wanna make sure that you give that a nice clean. And of course, I turn the temperature back on in the fridge as well. Back in the days where I had a very large walk-in closet that I used to share with Chad, we tackled our entire bedroom closet by taking everything out and putting it on our bed. That way, we had to deal with the closet that particular day, and it had to be done before bedtime, otherwise we wouldn't have anywhere to sleep. You can see the entire happenings of that video and get motivated to clean your own closet. Apparently, many of you seem to face the same problems that I do, according to your comments, when it comes to keeping this particular closet clean and organized. It seems like we have way too much stuff and not enough space, sort of a central theme we've been exploring with spring cleaning. And every time I go into my closet, I feel like it's this really overwhelming experience. So today, we're gonna change that. All we need is a laundry basket, a bag for donations, a bag for recycling, a vacuum cleaner, a couple of microfiber cloths, all-purpose cleaner, a step stool, and a mop if your closet has hardwood or tile flooring. And at the end of the video, I'll share with you my secret for getting through these crazy long haul cleaning tasks. So stay tuned for that. All right, let's get to it. The first thing we're going to do is clear absolutely everything out of the closet. Have a clear bed and a somewhat clean room to be able to accommodate the contents of your closet. Put all of your clothes on your bed for two reasons. Reason one, it's a big flat surface that will help you organize your clothing. And reason two, you won't be able to go to bed unless this job is done. And if you fill up your bed, like I did, use whatever surface you have available. Next, we're gonna clean this now empty closet and to kick that off, we're gonna sprinkle some baking soda on the carpet. Let the baking soda sit on the carpet for about 10 to 15 minutes and while you're waiting, you can vacuum any shelves in your closet. Next, take your all-purpose spray and cloth and give your shelves the old one-two. Then, take your vacuum and tackle your baseboards. As you can see, these get really dusty. And the final part of this step involves vacuuming up all the baking soda on the carpet. And don't forget to get into the corners with that crevice tool. Now, you should know that this is probably going to be the longest, most grueling part of the job. I'm smiling on the outside, but I'm secretly crying on the inside. But honestly, guys, this is where the rubber meets the road. It's your opportunity to rid yourself of all sorts of clothes that are doing nothing more than clogging up your closet. So, if it's a piece of clothing you haven't worn in 12 months, donate it. If it's a piece of clothing you constantly pass over in the closet, donate it. If you bought it a year ago and just haven't gotten around to wearing it yet, donate it. Your closet only needs to hold clothes you actually wear. If you don't wear it, there's no use of it being in your closet. For clothes that you are keeping but need to be washed, we'll place those in our laundry basket. If an item is damaged, soiled, or otherwise ruined beyond repair, consider making it into a rag or some kind of craft, or at the very least, find out how to recycle clothing in your community. There's never a need to just send clothing to a landfill. So we're down to the final few items, and I just wanna do a run through of some of the little toys I've picked up from my local organizing store called Solutions here in Canada, but in the States, I believe it's the Container Store. All right, so for my drawers, because I do keep some of my pajama tops and my workout gear, believe it or not, when I do work out, in a drawer. So I picked up these awesome OXO Good Grips uh, expandable drawer dividers. So basically, I'm going to be creating a custom section in my drawer. I'm really excited to use these. I've also picked up this blouse tree, and it is, I mean, if you were a kid, this would be so entertaining. But basically, it allows you to hang a bunch of blouses, and that saves a lot of space. So I'm gonna be using that for some of my blouses. 
This is our current uh, Thai storage solution for Chad. I don't even know how this thing was supposed to work. You can tell by its almond color, it's probably about 25 years old. So we figured we would pick up a more modern version uh, from Solutions. Here it is, a little Thai valet. And you can hang one tie on each of these little hooks. So we're gonna do that for Chad. And then this is a belt and scarf hanger. So I'm gonna be putting that in my closet as well. And I couldn't do an organizing video without stopping at Ikea. And I picked up these, they're called Drona. And we're going to be putting these on the top shelf of our closet. So easy to put together. You just put the bottom down. And we're gonna be putting some winter clothes like sweaters and sweatpants and heavier clothing items in here. And then popping those on the top shelf. I want to give you a quick final tour of what we accomplished today in our closet. And before I do that, I just want to tell you, Chad and I are very functional people. So we didn't want to go out and spend a whole bunch of money and restructure our whole closet. Although there are lots of videos out there that will show you how to completely revamp your entire closet. But we kept it easy, simple and cheap. And here's what we accomplished. We got a few baskets up at the top where we kept our winter items that we are not going to need for the next probably three months knowing Canadian weather. Then we've grouped all of our items together. So Chad has the right side of the closet, I have the left side. We keep like items with like items, so all long sleeve tops and sweaters are together. Chad uses these little pant hangers here to hang all of his pants which were previously stacked, so he's done that with four of them here. Then we've got the tie hanger. Again, like items with like items, some jackets, polos, moving on to dress shirts here. And then we've got my area with blouses, long sleeve tops, my new blouse tree, which is pretty nifty if I may say so myself, long dresses, short dresses, fancy dresses. Please invite me to your next fancy event. Some pants, skirts, jeans, and then of course my scarves and my belts. I'm feeling pretty good about this whole situation in my closet right now. It was hard work, but it was really worth it. There are many good reasons as to why you should clean your mattress. I know it's one of those things you probably don't think about often, but after you watch this video, I'm pretty sure I'll be able to convince you. Don't worry, I've got you covered. I will also show you how to do it. It is so quick and easy and it makes a big difference. After stripping your bed and throwing your sheets in the wash, rather than just remaking your bed immediately with a new set of sheets, open the windows, weather permitting, and let your mattress breathe. It needs time to just air out, kind of like a fine wine. Let it do its thing. Because all of the time that your mattress is made up, it doesn't have the opportunity for air to circulate and to naturally freshen it up. But when your window is open and the fresh air is blowing in, it actually makes a big difference in helping to deodorize and refresh your mattress. Let's say you're watching this video and you have an old stain on your mattress. If it's not bothering you, aside from the fact that it's an eyesore, I would just say to leave it. And here is why. Mattresses and moisture don't get along. So once your mattress gets some moisture in it, it really has nowhere to go. And that's where the concern about mold buildup in a mattress comes from. Now, if you have a fresh stain on your mattress, you wanna hop on that as quickly as you can. So as soon as something spills, you wanna blot it up like crazy to so get a super absorbent cloth, blot, 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 and you want your stain to be as dry as possible. The more moisture you can remove off the surface, the less will seep into your mattress and just sit there over time. Once that's done, you can then assess the surface stain, like the way it looks, and see if you actually wanna tackle it. And a product that I think would do really well would be an enzyme cleaner. They're really great at breaking stains down. Of course, it'll be entirely dependent on the type of stain that it is. But when you treat the stain, you wanna use as little product as possible. You can use a cleaning toothbrush just to kind of scrub it in and work it in really well. And then rather than pouring water on there to flush the stain, you actually wanna use a damp cloth to try and remove as much of the suds as possible. So that way you're not adding more moisture to the situation. I know I said the M word a lot. I know a lot of people don't like that, but sometimes you just gotta so let's rewind a bit. You've stripped your mattress, you're washing your sheets. What should you do now? I would recommend getting a vacuum with an upholstery brush attachment and a crevice tool. And you're going to use that 
to do a surface vacuum. Now you might not visibly see any dirt or dust on there, but this step makes a big difference because it's removing everything that's just surfacey, kind of sitting on top of your mattress that you can't see. So you'll take your vacuum, you'll work from top to bottom, left to right. You're gonna use that crevice tool if you have a pillow top and you've got some bumps that you need to get into and you wanna give it a good vacuum and then you're gonna just let it air out. By doing that, you're removing a lot of those dead skin cells, dust mite, anything that basically is gonna make you sneeze or make your mattress smelly. That's the whole point of doing the vacuum. Deodorizing your mattress. There are lots of techniques floating around on the internet. In fact, we did a video on this years ago and we talked about sprinkling baking soda on your mattress and that does work because baking soda is pretty amazing at absorbing odors. But I wanna change things up a little bit just to make sure that you're doing it correctly. And the way that I like to do it to get a nice consistent sprinkle is to sift it on. Once that's done, you're gonna let it sit for 30 minutes and then you're gonna vacuum it up using a shop vac, not your $1,000 brand new vacuum because baking soda over time can actually affect the quality of the motor. So you wanna make sure that you're using a vacuum that can handle a fine powder like baking soda. And then of course you wanna make sure that you're using a clean upholstery brush. Now there are some other articles that are out there talking about adding vinegar and water to a spray bottle in equal parts and spritzing that on your mattress and letting it air dry. Here's the thing, I don't think vinegar and water is really going to fix what's going on on a mattress. Frankly, I think more than anything, airing it out well, staying on top of washing your sheets is actually the best way to go. There are those times where you'll want to bring in a professional. Steam cleaning, deep cleaning, and bed bug cleaning are things that should be done by a pro. End point. General maintenance of your mattress includes rotating it, who knew? But yes, you do need to spin your mattress and the idea is to always spin it in the same direction and you do it once a season. So at the beginning of the season, you flip your mattress around just to even out the wear. Now, if you have a headboard, what you'll wanna do is maintain that as well by pulling your mattress out maybe by a foot because when you dust your headboard, dust falls from the top to the bottom right onto your mattress. So pull it out a little bit, have that leeway, and then vacuum or dust, and let the dust fall right to the floor instead of on your mattress. Now this might sound like a bit of an unhappy story, but there is a plot twist that can make this all a happy ending. Quite simply, use a mattress protector. Whether it's just one that looks like an extra fitted sheet that goes right on top of your mattress before you actually put your fitted sheet on, or you get a fully enclosed mattress protector. Either way, it's a moisture proof barrier between everything and your mattress. It just keeps it in much better shape. It prevents odors, it prevents moisture issues. It's a very small price to pay for a lot of insurance. So if you don't already have a mattress protector, do all the cleaning that we talked about and then throw one on and don't sweat it. Get it? This next video might as well be filmed in black and white because it is so old. It's one of the first videos we filmed. So reminder for me, I need to update this one, but it's how to clean your window sills and your tracks. Doesn't matter how old it is, the techniques make a lot of sense. Hello, window silligans. It's Melissa Maker here from Clean My Space. And I got a great question from Sandy. And Sandy asked me, Hi Melissa, how do I clean the window sills? They're a little bit dirty and I don't know what to do. Great question. So first, we'll talk about tools. What we need for this cleaning task is the cleaning toothbrush, a microfiber cloth, and a spray bottle on. The jet setting. If your sills and tracks are really bad, I would suggest vacuuming the area first. I mean, save yourself some time here. But mine aren't too bad, so we'll just use the regular method. You'll want to do the first half and then slide your window back and do the second half. 
So once my sill area here has been vacuumed or I've gotten rid of most of the debris, I want to handle the grime in between the window sills. So if you want, you can put perhaps a drop or two of dishwashing liquid in here, or you can even put a tablespoon of baking soda in there. Just something to help it get a bit clean. Did I say jet setting? I meant mist setting. Oops! Now what we'll do is let it sit. They let the product do the work for you. It makes my job a lot easier, and quite frankly, the less elbow grease, the better. So what I'll do is use the toothbrush exactly like how I would use it in my mouth, but on the windowsill track. So as you can see, I'm loosening all of the dirt that's around there. And then once the brushing is done, I'll take my cloth and wipe everything up so it can get nice and clean. Let's zoom in. Ew. Ew again. I gotta say, this is like the cleanest window cell on this side of the Mississippi. I also promised you I'd tell you how to help with that mold buildup that you would get on the side of your window sill or even in your window tracks. What you'd want to do is take about 10 drops of tea tree oil and add it to your spray bottle, treat your window sill area, leave it for about 10 or 15 minutes. Do the toothbrush thing that we just did, and then retreat the area gently. You don't want to over-soak it. The tea tree oil will inhibit the growth of the mold, but you have to get that looked into. That's a moisture issue. Sandy, I hope this answered your question. And remember, the next time you have any windowsill issues, the cleaning solution is only a toothbrush away. Another appliance that feels self-cleaning but is not is the dishwasher. And at least once a year, if not more frequently, you should be cleaning yours out. This video has you covered. It is a simple, straightforward technique and it makes a big difference, which you'll notice as soon as you start unloading your dishes. The first thing to do is to unload your dishwasher after you've done a cycle of dishes. This is the prime time for you to clean a dishwasher as soon as you've gotten a load out. Now, I do wanna point out this is a brand new dishwasher for us, although it is nowhere near a brand new dishwasher. This is the one that we acquired when we moved into the house. I'm still getting acquainted with it, and to do this video, uh, I actually went online to the Kenmore website to look up exactly how to deal with this dishwasher and how to clean it, uh, and where the filter was located, and I will get to that shortly. Uh, but if you are not 100% familiar with the inner workings of your dishwasher, take a minute, find the model, find the brand, and just go online and figure out how your dishwasher works. I'm just filling this measuring cup with white vinegar. That will be for later on at the end of this cleaning, but I just figured, hey, I might as well get it out of the way. Next, I'm removing the cutlery basket and the lower rack. This just makes the bottom area and the door much more accessible for cleaning. I'll clean the cutlery basket later, but I'm not going to clean the bottom rack. It didn't need it. Now I'm taking an all-purpose spray and I'm spraying the frame of the dishwasher as well as the door of the dishwasher. I find that gets the grimiest. Now I'm mixing equal parts baking soda and dish soap and I'm going to apply it with a cleaning toothbrush to the gasket and the frame of the dishwasher. As I said, this gets the crustiest, the grossest, and you can just spend some time going around these areas. I also went into the detergent tray as well. Just a quick little bonus. 
And I'll also point out that the area underneath your dishwasher might get some like crusty brown drips, so just be aware of that. Now my dishwasher doesn't have a removable filter, but the one in my old house does, so I'm gonna cut to that for you. Take out your dishwasher filter, soak it in hot soapy water, give it like a good one hour relaxation spa bath, then get a nylon bristle brush, scrub it really well, rinse it and replace it. And before you close the dishwasher, just grab a paper towel and give the base a quick wipe down. The spinning arm was removable, so I actually just gave that a quick rinse. If you notice that you're not getting water coming out of the spinning arm the way you'd like to, or your dishes aren't getting as clean, you might want to take some picture hanging wire and just quickly go in and out of those little holes that shoot the water. That can really help with efficiency. Now you can replace your spinning arm or your filter, and you can finish up any of the work around the frame and the gasket. So I just agitated everything after I applied that baking soda and dish soap mixture. Now I'm using some water to sort of loosen everything up and then a microfiber cloth to just wipe it and buff it. The door and the frame and the gasket practically look brand new. This was totally worth doing. Now I've got the cutlery basket and the bottom rack going back in and I'm going to put that cup of vinegar on the top rack of my dishwasher and run through a sanitized cycle. Now, you can do this with baking soda at the bottom. You can do this with a dishwashing cleaner tablet. As long as you do this with some sort of product that will help descale and deodorize your dishwasher, you're fine. Now, the exterior of my dishwasher being white does get a little bit discolored, so I'm using some baking soda on a cleaning toothbrush to remove some of that discoloration. Then I'll just clean it with some all-purpose cleaner and a microfiber cloth. And of course, if you have stainless steel appliances, you can give that a wipe down too. One thing I forgot to mention is your instrument panel. You do want to give that a little spray and wipe, and that's it. The linen closet is one of those places we call here at Clean My Space a clutter black hole. And that's exactly what happened with our linen closet shortly after we moved into this house. So in this upcoming video, I show you how we pull everything out, sort through it, and reorganize it so that it looks beautiful and feels functional. First things first, I need a stepladder because this thing is packed to the rafters. And I'm not being ladylike about this at all. I'm literally just ripping items out of the cupboard and throwing them onto the floor. Of course, if they can handle being thrown on the floor. Now, some of these items, to be very honest, have just been put in the cupboard because we haven't really known where else to put them. So today is also a big decision day. There are things where I'm just gonna have to decide, am I keeping this, am I getting rid of it, am I donating it, or am I finding a higher and better use for it? So sometimes I find when you're cleaning out these cupboards, those are the tough decisions that you have to make and that's why we tend to procrastinate. Now there are definitely things in here that I need to be mindful of. You know, we've got our first aid kit, we've got garbage bags and baby supplies. So coming up with an organization structure is really important. And because I am significantly shorter than Chad, I know that there are things that I will use less frequently that I can easily put up at the top and things that I will want to have more readily accessible for me because I'm not always going to have the stepladder there. Look at this pile. I'm proud. I'm proud. I'm a little embarrassed, but I'm proud. Back to the stepladder and I've decided I'm going to put all of our paper supplies up at the top first. Now, when it comes to toilet paper, I don't tend to just do one roll at a time in the bathroom. I'll have a few, let's call them satellite rolls, under the sink so that I can readily access them if needed. So the other stuff is going up there in longer term storage. I'm also taking these items out of their packages because I just find them easier to organize. I know some people feel like, no, you should leave them in packages, but for me, I'm very happy to have them unpackaged. So that goes for paper towel as well as tissue. And now I've got these matching but mismatched size-wise boxes that I'm going to use for various purposes. In our house, we do have a lot of lint rollers, so they are getting their own feature box. And then our first aid kit is getting an upgrade to this basket. So I'm going to put everything in there as organized and nicely as possible. But also I'm not being too precious about it. Like I'm kind of jamming it in there. You know, it's first aid kit. I don't have to spend hours on it. I've got my old sewing kit. Do you guys have that Danish butter cookie tin that you use for your sewing kit? Do you use a sewing kit? I, I don't, but I have it there just in case one day I need to. On the bottom is where I'm keeping all of our baby supplies. So diapers, wipes, and even the bags that we use for the diaper pail in Riley's room. 
Here I'm just sorting through some products that I know we won't likely use, so I'm going to put that to the side for disposal. Oh, was anybody a brownie or a spark or a girl guide? This is something I've always kept in my linen closet. I just can't get rid of it and the linen closet seemed to be the right place to keep it. Now I'm sorting through all of my towels. We have a ton of mismatched towels in our linen closet, let alone linens. So we're taking all of the towels that we don't use on a regular basis and we're putting them downstairs in our basement for our pool. But the ones that we use every day for showering are the ones that we're going to be keeping up here and organizing. I'm also just going to fold our linens. Currently we have way more linen sets for Riley than we have for ourselves, but that's fine. Folding it nice and neatly is really important. I always like to have the folded edges facing out and then the messy edges facing the wall. This little basket for washcloths, again, I'm not being too precious about it, just folding them up and putting them in there. And folding the towels is what I'll finish off with. Now what I want to tell you is this, when you have towels it's always good to have a few consistent sizes they fold up nicer and they're easier to categorize and also make sure that you fold them consistently so that everything looks neat I like to fold them in half so top over bottom and then I fold them side to side and then I fold them either in half again or in thirds This linen closet now feels so much airier and so much more functional It took me about an hour to do this but I am really happy that I did it Back in 2013, I tackled an age-old issue, how to deal with mold and mildew and that mysterious pink stuff in your bathroom. We're gonna clean a shower curtain and a mat in this video. I love the idea of every cloud having a silver lining. But I do not love the idea of every shower curtain having a pink or brown lining. Your shower mat and your plastic shower curtains get full of mildew and mold over time and develop a general funk. And I don't mean like an earth, wind and fire type funk, okay? They get full of mildew and mold. Firstly, they live in your shower and your shower is a damp, warm place and mold and mildew hurt that situation. And second, they are situated among bacteria, hard water, soap scum, and body oils, which adds to the yuckiness. So although we think of these delicate little spores as green in color, they are often a pinkish orange or a grayish brown hue and cling to shower walls and anything plastic within the shower vicinity. And there you have mold and mildew. So enough science. Let's figure out how to make these shower items look brand spanking new. So brace yourself for the easy way to clean your plastic shower mats and shower curtains. Here's what you'll need. Laundry detergent, one cup of baking soda, a washing machine, two to three towels, ideally light colored, and optional, 10 drops of tea tree oil. Now here's what to do. Start by removing the plastic shower curtains from the hooks and peel up the shower mat. Take them to your washing machine. Then place them in your washing machine along with a couple of towels. Add regular detergent and a cup of baking soda and tea tree oil if you choose to do so. Wash on the gentle cycle. When the wash cycle ends, simply rehang the plastic shower curtain to air it dry and hang the shower mat to allow all the water to dry off. The towels can then go into the dryer. We use the towels in the wash because they create a buffer between the washing machine and the delicate plastic curtain. They also assist in scrubbing away any of that mildew and dirt during the washing process. The baking soda is a mild abrasive that will further scrub away any of that moldy gunk and will also help deodorize any of that funk that's been growing in your plastic. Your total time involved in this task is under 10 minutes. I mean, aside from the wash time. One of the most simple and satisfying spring cleaning jobs someone can do is clean the exterior windows of their home. It just requires a little bit of time and a couple of special tools which are really easy to come by. The techniques are simple, it takes next to no time, and it has a huge impact. Do you know why professional window cleaners use microfiber pads and squeegees to clean their clients' windows? Well, neither do I, but I'm sure there's a very good reason for it. Now, a long time ago, I cleaned my windows using only vinegar and paper towels. 
But truth be told, it's quite time consuming using the spray and wipe procedure. And more often than not, I would get frustrated with the streaky results. And reading the comments, I know many of you are having the same issues. There's got to be a better way. Well, there was a better way. And that involves one of these. This is a squeegee scrubber combination tool. And these cost about 10 bucks at your local big box. When I bought mine over the weekend, it was on sale or maybe mispriced for three bucks. So now the only other stuff you're going to need aside from this is a bucket, a microfiber cloth and some dish liquid. So all you need to do is put a few drops of dish liquid into your bucket and fill it about halfway with warm water. We're going to use the microfiber scrubbing pad to wash the windows and then we'll use the squeegee to wipe them clean and dry. And a quick note, if you find that your rubber squeegee tends to go on you, you can always buy replacements. Dip the scrubbing pad into your mixture and apply it to the glass in an S pattern. Try to get into all of the corners. Next, you'll use the squeegee and start at the top, wiping from one side to the other, just like they do at the gas station. Then you can use a microfiber cloth to wipe the frames and corners clean, just to catch any of that extra moisture. Now, you can attach a pole to your squeegee tool to reach windows that would normally be out of reach. Just make sure that you buy a threaded squeegee and that you have a threaded extension pole. You can also use this tool indoors. Just use less water on your scrubbing pad and maybe, for good measure, place a rag or cloth at the bottom of the window to protect your window sills. I most noticed the winter mess in my car, most notably the car mats, those rubber mats where you know your dirty winter boots sit on as you're driving your car from here to there. Every single year without fail, mine are disgusting. So in this video, we're heading outside and we're cleaning those dirty winter car mats. The best product to use for this task is plain white vinegar. I'm just adding some to a clean spray bottle. And then I'm using an iron handle brush, just dry, and I'm brushing off all of the loose dirt and salt that's been ground into these car mats over those cold winter months. It's important to shake off your mat as well, that way none of the debris sits on there for the next step. Now I'm treating each of the car mats with the plain vinegar. Don't worry, you cannot overdose on this and then you can rub it in again with that iron handle brush. This will help agitate further and lift out some dirt. And if you have to repeat it a few times, no big deal. Following that, I'm using a high pressure head on my garden hose to really get rid of any of the extra dirt or salt. You can even see some of the salt coming out of my mat. Then I'll put them in the sun to dry. For plastic car mats, I'm filling a bucket with water and adding a squirt of dish soap, maybe a tablespoon or so. Then I'm using that same iron handle brush just to give a good scrub down to those mats. I like the iron handle brush because it can really get into those cracks and crevices and you can give her while you're scrubbing. It's kind of like taking your car mats to the dentist for a good cleaning. Now I'm using that same high pressure hose to get rid of any of that soapy water or any of that grime. And a really good trick that I have to get any of those extra remnants up is to spritz the plastic car mats with some white vinegar. And once that is sprayed on, I'm just wiping it off with a microfiber cloth. This will help get rid of any extra salty stuff. Every now and then my husband likes to eke his way into the Clean My Space feed and he decided to take apart his entire side of the closet and reorganize it. And that's what this video is all about. I actually think it's a really important one for everyone to see because so often you just see me doing my thing, but you know what? Everyone in a household contributes and everyone in a household is responsible for their own stuff. So check this one out. This is my half of the closet. It's where I keep most of my clothes. 
There are 55 pieces of clothing hanging on this rod. There are 27 pairs of pants on that shelf. And there's a pile of laundry over there in the corner. But that's not where this clown car of clothing stops. Oh no, let's add in the 13 ties which I never wear. And let's not forget about the drawers which are stuffed like pizza pockets with clothes that fell out of favor years ago but I've just kept hanging on to for some weird reason. But wait, there's more. Over here in this dresser where I keep my dainties, my unmentionables, if you will, I also keep my shorts and active wear here. And this is also home to my beloved t-shirt collection. Now I'm no fashion plate, and contrary to popular belief, I'm not a male model, so there's no real reason for me to have this many clothes. The truth is, I probably only wear about 20% of the items I've shown thus far in the video. And that got me to thinking, what if I were to get rid of half of the clothes in my closet? I had no idea where to start this process, so I threw caution to the wind, I threw on some rush, and I just started grabbing clothes and made two piles. One pile will be a stays pile, those are clothes that I'm keeping, and the other is a goes pile, which will have all of the clothing that will be donated, given away, or sold. So how did I decide where each piece of clothing would end up, you may ask? Well, that's an excellent question and my answer is pretty stupid because I just kind of winged it. I was literally just trying to remove 50% of the clothing in my closet, so that meant for every shirt I wanted to keep, I had to get rid of a shirt. And that strangely created a little popularity contest in my head where it became easier to part with pieces of clothing I only kind of liked versus pieces of clothing that I really, truly love. So I did my best to keep track in my head about the difference between the two piles and that was made easier by being able to get rid of a lot of the clothing that I just don't wear anymore. I have like eight dress shirts and I only need three. I have five blazers and I'd have more than enough with, again, three. And did I mention 27 pairs of pants for some reason? When I got to the bins of clothing, it got even easier because this is the stuff I haven't worn in over two years. So with the exception of a few soccer jerseys and these very comfortable shorts, I got rid of a lot of stuff. I'm definitely keeping the Blue Jays jersey. I'm also going to hang on to this t-shirt and this t-shirt, but it's probably time to part with the Dumb Ways to Die shirt. Next, we'll tackle the drawers, and all of this clothing has sat here for like 18 months, so it's pretty easy just to part with most of this stuff. I remember buying these colorful pants during my colorful pant phase. Let's not forget these shin guards for all the soccer I play. And finally, the ties. I figure I'm safe with three nice ties, so I can part with the rest of them. So there we go. Here is a cat for scale. We have two huge piles of clothes, and I submit that the goes pile is a solid 25% larger than the stays pile. So we're off to a great start. Before we go any further, I need to free up some of the space on the bed, so I'm going to put all of the clothes that are going to be staying in my wardrobe back into the closet and hang everything up nice and neatly. It was at this point that Molly decided to roll on out, so let me take this opportunity to thank Molly for all of her hard work and her help this afternoon.
Okie dokes, let's tackle my undercrackers. Now I remember a few years back when Melissa had to show her underwear on camera and she said it was a little weird. Well, Melissa, I now understand why you said that. It's weird to show your underwear on camera. Now we can sort my socks. I have a huge collection of socks, colorful ones, funny ones, but also a lot of old ones that I rarely wear anymore. Uh, and it's really nice to move on from those. In this bottom drawer, that's where I keep my active wear and my shorts. And I easily managed to move half of that stock out of there. Uh, and maybe someone else might be able to actually be active in that active wear. And that brings us to the final drawer, a very important drawer, my beloved t-shirt collection. I was really nervous about parting with the t-shirts, but I applied the same reasoning to them, keep the ones that I love, move on from everything else, and it really wasn't all that hard at all. But as for my Sacred Steely Dan 2017 Tour t-shirt, it must reside somewhere special. In a special drawer, all by its special self, as a tribute to those Yacht Rock gods. So I may not have hit the 50% mark with my t-shirts, but I made up for it in other areas, so that's okay with me. You may remember this shot from seven and a half minutes ago. This is what my overstuffed closet looked like before. But now I have a reasonable amount of clothing and a closet which is substantially less overwhelming, making it easier to find the clothes that I actually want to wear. I won't lie, I love my new closet situation. And honestly, it still feels like I have more clothes than I realistically need, but it's so refreshing to be free of those storage bins and the 27 pairs of pants. And over here in my dresser, I have slimmed down my selection of underwear. My sock collection is also well under control. I still have way too many socks. My shorts and my active wear has been totally tamed and I still have enough for any active activities. And lastly, my t-shirt collection still offers me a wide selection to choose from even though I have slimmed it down quite a bit. And that leaves me with one final job. I need to find the best way to donate all of this clothing. And I'm also kind of interested in selling a few of my really nice items. But look at how much stuff I'm parting with. I never thought that it would be quite this much. I'm excited to give this clothing some newfound usefulness and I'm excited to free up all of this space in my closet. When Melissa got home later that night, I was excited to share my success with her. However, she didn't seem as excited as I was. She mentioned something about wanting to go to bed and asked me why I piled them on her side of the bed or something like that. I, I, I really wasn't listening. So I piled them in the corner. I briefly flirted with the idea of turning them into a chair or maybe a nightside table, but I've got to get rid of them 
and I was thinking about filming a follow-up video which talked all about donating clothing and furniture and everything else. I know we get a lot of questions about it, so let me know in the comments down below if you would like to see a follow-up video all about donations and donating clothing. All right, folks, as always, thanks very much for watching. If you would like to follow any of my out of the closet adventure, wait, that didn't sound right. If you'd like to follow any of my adventures when I'm out of my closet, follow me on Instagram. I'm at the Chad Reynolds. Be sure to subscribe to the Clean My Space channel for more great videos like this one and give this video a like if you liked it. Thanks for watching. I openly admit that Chad likes to clean much more than I do, and I'm so grateful that he tackled our garage because that truly is one of the places I like to clean the least. So in this video, you can see how he tackles our two-car garage. How's it going, Clean My Space Nation? This was a highly requested video. On our last Clean With Me video, we asked, what should we clean next? You guys said the garage, so here you go. It's time we cleaned out the garage anyway because it is a huge mess. A bunch of cardboard boxes need to be broken down and there's just a bunch of stuff which ended up in this garage that wasn't supposed to be in the garage. We got a house with two garages so we could fit our two cars in there, but as soon as we moved in, the garage became a bit of a storage space, so Today's the day that we're going to change that. The first thing I'm going to do is empty everything, aside from the cardboard, out from the garage. I'm gonna be using the lawn as a way station from here. All of this stuff will either be donated or sent to the dump or the recycling center or some of it might be sold or given away. But either way, a lot of this stuff is not going back into the garage. We want to limit the contents of our garage to just things that have to do with the car. So things like windshield washer fluid or the jack or some oil or cleaning products and a few landscaping items like clearly the lawnmower needs to stay in here and a few other items needed for the garden. I scheduled this job in so I knew I would have enough time. I scheduled in four hours. It actually took me a little less than three hours to complete the job. All of this wood and these moldings were left over from our reno. Do want to keep it though in the garage, especially because the previous owner made it so that you can kind of store wood along the back here by making that little support out of a two by four. And lastly, let's move the John Deere for now. Now it's time for probably what is my least favorite job and that's once all of the boxes over the course of a whole bunch of Amazon orders and because we were completely making over our patio, we had a whole bunch of boxes from the Home Depot which all of the 
furniture came in. Plus we had some toys from Riley that came in boxes. And I don't know, cardboard just kind of seems to take over. And man, did it take over. And then I got a couple of visitors and I decided to take a break. All right, let's get back to it. The way that it works in my city when you are recycling large amounts of cardboard, they ask that you bundle it together and it not be larger than three or four feet long. So I'm just taking some string and I'm bundling all of the cardboard for recycling. Now for a really dirty job, I'm going to put on some safety eyewear and some safety breathing wear and some safety hand wear and we're going to sweep. Then we are going to blow all of the dust, dirt, and debris up out this garage. Now let's put all the stuff that belongs in the garage back into the garage. We found a home for everything else on the lawn. This is all that remains, just a few of the car items. My golf stuff ended up in the garage, plus a few other odds and ends. But for the most part, the garage now looks remarkable. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, leave a like and also leave a comment down below and let us know what space we should clean next. I think one of the stinkiest, dirtiest places in a home is in a garbage can. And that's why we talked about exactly how to clean and deodorize garbage bins and recycling and compost bins. Check it out. Kick things off by emptying your garbage. Obviously you want it to be nice and clear for you to get to work. And once that's done, you can take an all-purpose cleaner. And here I'm just using warm water and a tablespoon of dish soap and spraying it around the exterior of the garbage can. That can sort of do its thing. It's gonna get rid of any buildup that has sort of fallen when things have been loosely tossed into the trash. Then I'll move to the interior. I'm going to spray that down as well with the same mixture and to get rid of the odors and to scratch off some of that really cruddy garbagey stuff I'm gonna to toss in about half a cup of baking soda and just let that do its thing the baking soda is designed to remove any of the buildup but the key part here is the baking soda also helps deodorize and anything that can neutralize garbage odors that is perfectly welcome in my house make sure you spray the interior really well you want it dripping basically. The exterior of course you can get started on by just using an S pattern and wiping it down. The inside of the garbage can you want that to sit for about five to ten minutes. Reason being the baking soda really needs time to do its work. Then take a good quality sponge but one that you're not going to be too sad to part with because I can assure you you're probably going to toss this one afterward and start scrubbing your garbage can from the top working your way down to the bottom. I'm going to make sure that I'm also getting the lid of my garbage can as well, making sure that you get all of that crud in there, rinsing your sponge as needed, and of course, ensuring that you don't fall into the bottom of your garbage can. Now it's time to rinse out the sudsy mess, so depending on the size of your garbage can, you can either do this in your kitchen sink, obviously you will clean your sink after, or you can do it outside where you have a garden hose. Then you wanna make sure that you dry it really, really well. Now, if you have a metal or a stainless steel garbage can like I do, 
you'll want to make sure that the exterior looks nice and shiny. So if it needs a second go round with a microfiber cloth and some all-purpose cleaner, definitely go for it. A shiny garbage can is a clean garbage can. When you actually are ready to put the bag back, before you do so, crumple up a few pieces of newspaper and pop that at the bottom of the garbage can. The reason you want to do that is because newspaper not only will help to keep odors at bay, but it will also absorb those classy garbage drippings and that can be tossed and replaced. And that's a much easier way to keep your garbage can odor free and grime free for longer. Speaking of which, you wanna clean your garbage can at least twice a year. I recommend doing it fall and spring. That way you don't have to do it in the heat of the summer where your garbage can reeks and in the middle of winter when you're freezing your buns off trying to rinse out a garbage can. When you're cleaning your outdoor garbage containers, obviously the best time to do this is right after garbage day. You are going to make up a solution in a spray bottle of equal parts dish soap and white vinegar. This is a really powerful cleaner. It can degrease, it can deodorize, and trust me, your container is gonna need it. Take it to an area that you have a lot of free space to work in, and obviously the fact that you're in open air is great because this mixture does smell a little bit, and you're gonna do a three-phase spray. And the reason we do this is because we're gonna give the product the opportunity to really work, then we're gonna hit it again with more product, and then we're gonna wait, and we're gonna hit it again with more product, and we're gonna wait, then we're gonna scrub. You're gonna see that the product really helps break down that grease and grime, makes it so much easier to clean, which means less elbow grease for you. So mix up that solution, spray your entire garbage can outside, inside, top to bottom, wait five minutes. Then come back, do it all over again. Wait five minutes, come back, do it once more, and after five minutes, you're gonna fill a bucket with some hot, soapy water, and you'll just start to scrub. Now, it does require some elbow grease, but the fact that we spent that 15 minutes pre-treating is really gonna reduce the amount of scrub time you have. Once you're done scrubbing, and again, don't skimp here, this is you know an important job, you're gonna give the garbage can a really good rinse out with a hose. When that's done, put it in a sunny area and let it dry. I recommend doing this twice a year. Again, fall and spring are a perfect time. Garbage cans are kind of like toilets. They have a pretty thankless job and they get thrown a lot of crap. It's really important that we take good care of them because a smelly garbage can is a huge turnoff. And well, it's a turnoff for us, but it really attracts the wrong kind of things, if you know what I'm talking about. So make sure that you give your garbage can a little bit of TLC. Trust me, it goes a long way. You will feel so much cleaner and better for the fact that you have a clean garbage receptacle. The area under the kitchen sink is valuable real estate in a home and it must be treated with special care, which is why in this video we talk about how to clean it, pull everything out, check for any damage or leaks, and then put everything back in an organized fashion. I know it feels like you wanna jam everything under the kitchen sink, but it is a small area and you should only keep very specific stuff in there. Now the area under the kitchen sink is called a black hole for a reason. It's very easy for us to just jam things under there when we don't wanna look right at it. And then it sort of starts to look like this. I know you guys think that I must live in the cleanest home. Nope, this has not been staged. That is legit what it looks like under my sink. So the first thing to think about are the products and tools that you keep under your kitchen sink and what actually belongs there. Mine is a pretty good representation of what actually belongs under the sink. It's just a little bit cluttered. We'll cover that, don't worry. The things that you want to have under your sink are the things that must be readily accessible in your kitchen pertaining specifically to the dishes or any other kitchen related cleaning tasks. So your general cleaning caddy, that should not be under your kitchen sink. It'll take up too much space and there's too much risk of product spillage and confusion and also it's going to get cluttered. The other thing that we keep under here are cleaning tools like sponges, brushes, anything that we would use for dishes or kitchen cleaning. And then of course, garbage bags because we got garbage, we got composting, and there are a lot of bags that you gotta deal with. And then of course we have our reusable shopping bags as well. When I was growing up, we too had a kitchen sink with a cupboard underneath it where we kept cleaning products and supplies, go figure. And 
For whatever reason, there was a big stain and some damage that happened underneath that kitchen sink and it was irreparable. The way to avoid that is to use a plastic liner and so many things can happen. You can have a leak that would cause damage. You have cleaning products that are constantly wet. You're putting them back underneath the sink. The wet on the bottom of the container can cause damage over time. So the quick way to avoid that is to either use plastic containers or if you have bottles scattered here and there, you can use a plastic liner. Now I have a combo of both scattered and plastic. So I think I am actually going to get a liner now that I re-examine the situation, but you do what works for you as long as you are protecting this bottom shelf right here. This has happened to me before. I've opened the cupboard doors and I've noticed a musty kind of moldy mildewy smell. Now, that's not a smell that's just gonna go away on its own if you put a bowl of baking soda under there, no. That smell is indicating to you that there is a leak. There's something going on with the plumbing under your sink. Now, if you're comfortable, if you got the plumbing gene, fine, go ahead, have a look, see if you can fix the problem. And remember, there are a lot of nooks and crannies under here. There's a lot of stuff that could be going on. If you don't know your plumbing P's and Q's, call a plumber, let them deal with it. That's what I do. And then once the problem's taken care of, you won't notice the smell anymore and you don't have to worry about any water damage happening to the bottom of your cupboard here. The area under the kitchen sink can be small and awkward. I'm not being discriminatory, it's the truth. I'm just stating the facts. But finding adequate storage solutions so that you can keep everything organized and accessible is key in a space like this. So a couple things that we like to do, we use this removable shower bar here. You can pick it up anywhere. It's adjustable so you can fit it exactly to the size of your cupboard. And what we like to use it as is a tension rack so we can hang our bottles on there. It's very convenient. The other thing that we like to do is use plastic storage containers to separate out our cleaning products from our cleaning tools like sponges and brushes. And then the garbage bags, they're kind of self-boxed so they don't need a storage solution. I've always thought it's kind of weird to have a box in a box. But anyway, whatever you like to do is fine as long as it's organized and you know where to find things, that's what we're looking for. A couple times a year, this isn't something that you need to do on a regular basis, but you will want to attend to this space because it can get overrun and cluttered and smelly and grotty. So all you have to do is pull your items out, give the area a wipe down. That's a great time to replace your liner or put one down if you don't already have one. You can check for leaks. You can also sort through any of the items that you have under the sink decluttering. Hey, it's always a good opportunity to do that. Wipe down any of your containers, replace the items, and put it all back there nice and neat. And remember, when you are buying items to go under your kitchen sink, you never wanna have duplicates under there because it is a limited space, so Replace your items as you run out of them instead of stocking up and keeping duplicates under here. If you've made it this far in the video, you deserve a thumbs up. So I'm giving one to you. And also a quick reminder that if you're interested in our 50 DIY cleaners ebook, you can go check that out over on our website, cleanmyspace.com shop. I've also got a link for you down below. And if you're in the spring cleaning mood and you like me talking alongside you doing all the hard work, I'm happy to throw you to this video, which is a clean with me playlist. So enjoy that. Enjoy your spring cleaning. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.